start recording. Thank you. So just as the first housekeeping tip, um, as many of you know, because you're repeat offenders of book club, um, we do record these and uh, these sessions are very, very useful, I think, for some of our online membership and we promote them through all sorts of social media channels, etc. I am Rebecca Schutt. I am the Executive Director of Citizens for Global Solutions, and it is our great honor and pleasure um, to be collaborating on this iteration of Book Club with our friends from WFM Canada, the World Federalist Movement Canada. We are both member organizations of the World Federalist Movement Institute for Global Policy, and I see Alan Ware has joined us as well, who is the Program Director and Interim Executive Director of WFMCA. And this iteration of Book Club is exploring um, Honorable Douglas Roche's book. Oh, it's a little bit blurry. I'm sorry. Is that good? Okay. Keep Hope Alive, Essays for a War-Free World. And we are delighted that um, this book club session will feature um, a wonderful speaker who um, Alex McIsaac, the executive director of WFM Canada, will introduce, um, Kekishan Basu, um, who is noted in the book, as um, one of the leaders of the next generation um, of peace activists. Um, and I will note that um, hope is, I think, by definition, an intergenerational enterprise. So we were honored to have uh, Douglas Roche with us for the first session of the book club exploring his book. And with Kakashan kicking off this next one, I think it is very fitting in terms of a torch passing. Um, I have a couple other comments that I'll just note at the outset before passing the mic to Alex to truly uh, get started with Kekishan's introduction, um, which is that um, we are delighted to announce that as of this weekend, we are carrying for the torch again with um, a opportunity to lead impact coalitions uh, for the Civil Society Conference for the Summit of the Future um, and are also collaborating with WFM um, and other institutions on the interim or excuse me the People's Pact for the Future focused on peace and security which picks up man many of the themes that are addressed in the book. So I hope that we'll have the opportunity to explore over the course of the next less than an hour and a half um, a little bit about how we can innovate the words to action and are doing so at our organizations and across, thank you so much for the link, Drea, um, and across the, the WFM movement. Um, I'm coming to you from Washington, DC, from the unceded and ancestral grounds of the Anacostan people and um, have recently been in Hamburg, where we have been discussing the treaty drafting for a new international anti-corruption court that I also would love to share with anybody who's interested. Um, with that, I think I will pass to my dear friend and colleague and counterpart at World Federalist Movement Canada, Alex McIsaac, uh, who can introduce our guest speaker and kick us off. Thanks so much, Rebecca. Um, so to introduce uh, Kekeshan Basu, our uh, speaker for today. Um, she is a Canadian environmental and human rights activist from the uh, United Arab Emirates. Uh, Basu also advocates for peace, children's rights, education for sustainable development, nuclear disarmament, gender uh, equality, and climate justice. Uh, so after that, I will pass on to you, uh, Kekeshan, I guess. Yeah, thank you very much, Alex. And hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be with all of you today. And uh, yes, I was born and raised in the UAE, but I'm actually Canadian. Um, and I'm from uh, Toronto, uh, Canada, but I'm currently based in Ithaca in upstate New York because I am finishing up my MBA at Cornell University, graduating this May. So very excited about that. Um, I'm a United Nations human rights champion and the founder president of Green Hope Foundation which is a global organization committed to uh, really working towards all aspects of sustainable development. One of the most important aspects uh, and interconnecting aspects being uh, peace. And I wanted to, uh, first of all, thank all of you for inviting me to be here today. And I wanted to, first of all, share a bit about my journey in this sustainability movement, uh, how I came into this movement and then uh, talk a bit about how my team and I of uh, 
primarily young people, but really it's an intergenerational organization, how we really work to harness technology for social good and for achieving peaceful societies, which would then bring me into, you know, how we utilize on the online world and digital technology as well, like Zoom, which was what uh, Senator Roche, uh, where I was featured in Senator Roche's book, uh, that part was about. So uh, I started my work really, really young. Uh, my first uh, moment of realization when I realized I had to do something uh, was when I was uh, seven and saw the image of a dead bird with its belly full of plastic. And I'm trying to share my screen, but it says host has disabled screen sharing. So I'd be obliged if host could enable screen sharing. Thank you. Uh, so let me see if this works. It works. Okay. So uh, yeah, my very first uh, instance was when I was seven and I saw this image of uh, the dead bird with its belly full of plastic and was deeply disturbed by that because it really made me uh, realize that there was something seriously wrong with our world for allowing such an innocent creature to suffer through so much pain. And it kind of opened my eyes to uh, the all of the other problems, interconnected problems that existed around the world and how this apathy, this human apathy was actually one of the main causes for this lack of peace that we were experiencing across the world. And so that led me to plant my first tree on my eighth birthday and my birthday is World Environment Day, 5th June. So I thought that that was uh, the, a message from above that I was meant to be an eco warrior, but obviously I realized as I grew older, it took a lot more work to actually uh, create change. So I started by engaging my fellow children in taking actions within their communities uh, to convince uh, children and adults alike to become stewards of planet, uh, stewards of the community, uh, and realize that we all needed to kind of come together to create a more peaceful world. But the next life-changing moment occurred for me when I was uh, the youngest uh, delegate to speak at the Rio Plus 20 Earth Summit, which at the time was the largest sustainable development conference of the time. And with peace, of course, being one of the overarching themes. And given that out of 50,000 delegates, there were only five people under the age of 18, that really opened my eyes to how not inclusive the entire decent sustainability process was, because how are you supposed to achieve any kind of peace if you kept excluding all of these people who are like meant to be a part of this? So it was young people, children, women, underserved communities. Uh, so all of these people were excluded. And then people who were talking about peace, about conservation, about uh, stopping poverty, like all of them were, you know, in these rooms, but not really connected to what was going on at the ground level. And so I decided to change that. And on my return home, I founded Green Hope Foundation, which is now a global social innovation enterprise working across 28 countries with over half a million people. And as I mentioned earlier, our work addresses every single aspect of uh, sustainability, where we first start with providing the knowledge uh, that then turns into ground level actions. And, uh, you know, I could really talk and talk and go on about all of the work that we do, but I wanted to focus on uh, the work that we do specifically relating to uh, technology and social uh, good to date. And how specifically that relates to peace and intersectionality. Because one thing that we realized, you know, working on the ground in uh, very, very underserved communities and also in, in the digital world during the pandemic is that none of these issues that affect our world, whether that's the health crisis or lack of access to education, um, food insecurity, water insecurity, none of these things exist in silos. And all of them come together to create this lack of peace. And so if we want to create any sort of peaceful society, we have to address all of these interconnected problems first. So because it's not like, you know, we can just take one action and we'll achieve peace. There's a lot of different actions that need to be taken to address all of these different issues to create a peaceful world. And we look at this uh, this 
task of a, creating a more peaceful world as a global challenge, wherein you know there are global issues that exist, there are local issues that exist, but the solutions that need to be implemented do need to be global in nature, taking into account all of those unique intersectionalities. So how do we do that? So one, some of the first examples that I wanted to share was, you know, how we facilitate education through clean energy technology. So we implement, we, we build solar powered computer labs in different parts of the world. So this enables uh, children, especially, especially at risk youth, to gain, get access to IT education and skill sets, and then be able to, you know, we're able to bring them out of this vicious cycle of drugs and crime. So this is specific to a rural civil war torn and climate change affected community in Liberia. And then we are able to see that through these skill sets, uh, they are able to get good jobs. They are able to contribute to creating peace in their communities, because obviously with that education, they have the knowledge and skill sets to uh, have gainful employment and uh, help their community uh, to be more peaceful. And it looks different in different parts of the world because we built our solar powered computer labs in uh, rural Western uh, India as well in a community primarily composed of migrant workers. And there we saw that uh, the computer lab had to be targeted to providing STEM education to girls, especially because it was a community where gender inequity was one of the main causes of this lack of peace. And therefore we wanted to be able to address that by providing girls with access to STEM education, which would then slowly and steadily we're seeing contributes to peace. Uh, we built our, and this was during the pandemic when you know everything kind of went online, but we realized that if we had to actually create positive change during the pandemic, we needed to reach out to those who weren't a part of the digital world. And so during the pandemic, we built our solar powered school in uh, rural Bangladesh and uh, in the community by climate change. And there we it functions as first as a, a general school for girls in the mornings providing climate resilience education. And then it functions as a sewing school for women in the evenings to provide them with entrepreneurial skill sets. And once again, through gender equality, we are addressing, uh, you know, we are achieving peace there. And during the pandemic too, we harnessed this clean solar technology to uh, build our solar powered mobile libraries, which are even now taking books to the doorstep of thousands of out of school children, especially girls, providing them with the very important education that they missed out on during the pandemic. And uh, combined with the pandemic also, you know, communities suffering from climate change induced disasters, all of which create a lack of peace and now we are addressing that. And then we saw that in a lot of the communities that we worked in, food insecurity was one of the main causes of a lack of peace because it uh, caused conflict. It was, uh, a, you know, it was a way to kind of push forward even greater gender inequity because obviously women and girls are much more affected with uh, these levels of food insecurity. And so we utilize solar technology through agrivoltaics. So empowering rural women farmers to be able to grow their own food, utilizing agrivoltaics that harnesses energy, like solar energy for the dual use of you know, agriculture and providing uh, working with energy sources. And then this way we were able to increase crop yield by 30% for these uh, farms. And we were also able to utilize the whole energy grid to power the homes of the farmers in those surrounding environments. And then we looked at it, you know, how were we, how would we harness this in different parts of the world? So we took that uh, to Caribbean. So I'll, I'll talk about it later. Uh, growing food in pots in uh, Peru, utilizing that to reclaim land with the indigenous women workers. They're uh, working with children in cities as well to uh, facilitate backyard kitchen urban farming and utilizing solar powered cookers in uh, to train women and girls in these very, very vulnerable communities to practice clean cooking that would not only create peaceful societies all 
ground because it's reducing all of the you know greenhouse gas emissions, respiratory health issues, but also because it was a way for us to provide them with uh, the sense of upliftment that they were able to utilize this for social good within their communities. And that looks different, again, in different parts of the world. So in Bangladesh, that was clean cook stoves where uh, these cook stoves that we installed there had uh, made sure that the pipe was facing away from the women and girls. It Instead of burning the usual firewood, it would be the jute residue, so less waste. And this was really, you know, we kind of really saw how people are often opposed to peace when it doesn't benefit them. So in a community where gender inequality is really, really rampant, when we were installing these uh, these clean cook stoves, our girls on the ground and the women regularly got threats from the men and the elders of their village uh, because they said that, you know, there is no point in trying to provide women specifically with uh, these clean cook stoves because, you know, their health doesn't matter. Uh, they w If they tried to create peaceful societies through gender equality over there, it, they thought that, you know, the men wouldn't benefit uh, from it. So uh, they were very, very opposed to that. But slowly and steadily, they were able to see that by empowering the women and girls of their communities, it actually benefited everyone, like people of all genders. And so they slowly and very begrudgingly, they were like, okay, uh, I think this is something that works out for everyone. So it was a lesson for us as well. And we see this through all of our work that peace takes time and effort and patience, and there's going to be like, you know, backlash, but we have to just keep working through it. So this was a prime example of that. And then we implemented electric cook stoves as uh, well to, for peace in these, uh, in Liberia. And the water farm that I was talking about earlier, water insecurity was one of the biggest issues that was contributing to a lack of peace in Caribbean, which is a small island developing state and suffering from the impacts of climate change. And so there was an increase, there is still an increase of brackish salty water coming in due to rising sea levels due to climate change, and that is polluting their groundwater. And uh, they're also suffering from drought, so not enough rainfall. And so all of these are combining to create a not very peaceful environment. And so through this technology, we are purifying water, both the groundwater and the rainwater to provide clean drinking water to the communities and also water for their crops. So, uh, you know, addressing multiple uh, challenges in the communities that in turn creates peace. And then we realized the importance of uh, using this technology to address cross-cutting issues. So for instance, in Sundarbans, in, this is on the Indian side, the largest mangrove forest in the world, we work to empower tiger widows through fish farming in a community where women who've lost their husbands to tiger attacks are seen as pariahs. And obviously that is not conducive for a peaceful environment. And so we utilize, we repopulate the fish ponds uh, with local indigenous fish species. So that's protecting biodiversity. And then we train them in fish farming and an entrepreneurial skill sets so that they're able to sell that, gain a stable source of income and send their children to school, all of which contributes to peace. And uh, the last kind of example I wanted to share before coming to the digital world is we utilize technology for uh, creating safe spaces, which is one of the most important aspects when we think about a peaceful society. And this is done through our solar powered streetlights. So in many of the communities that we work in, especially those affected by climate change, women and girls often feel very unsafe coming out of their homes in the evenings because uh, they, uh, you know, it increases risk of trafficking, abuse, and exploitation. And so they just, their mobility is severely uh, restricted in that sense. And so through the solar powered streetlights, we provide them with the safe spaces uh, to come out of their homes in the evenings, have the freedom to do so. And this in turn alleviates a lot of the mental and psychological stress that climate change often causes. And this is our way of creating peace in those communities with the simple you know, act of installing this technology that creates uh, social good. 
And then what we do is, you know, we take the work that we do at the grassroots to uh, the highest levels of policymaking at the United Nations to make sure that we are able to try and bridge the gap between top down and bottom up approaches towards achieving peace. And this is when, you know, we actually, during the pandemic, this brings us to how we started utilizing the digital world and online technology such as Zoom to work to create peace. Because what we realized is that while we were, you know, doing all of the work on the ground uh, during the pandemic, before that, way before that, and after the pandemic, we realized that one of the best ways that we could engage with like-minded, passionate people was through the online world and utilizing one of uh, the best tools that we have at hand. So social media, Zoom, and all of these different technology sources available to us to spread the word about what we were doing, learn from other people, and so sharing best practices, and then really see how best we could localize all of those teachings in our own spheres of influence. And so Senator Roche was one of uh, our, the speakers at several of of our webinars and the best part of the webinars that you know we organized spoke at uh, spoke at moderated was that they were very very diverse they were very very intergenerational and you really were able to kind of understand why it's so important to get every single person involved in this uh push for peace and how much good work is actually going on in the world. I feel that right now with all of the global challenges that are taking place and with this lack of peace, there's this very alarmist approach that's often put forward and uh, people don't pay enough attention to the hope aspect and turning that hope and keeping that hope alive to create positive change. And, you know, Green Hope Foundation, our name literally has the word hope in it, we always keep that hope alive through our ground level actions. But what we realized, you know, utilizing Zoom, for instance, to connect with people across the world was that there were so many other people who had kept this hope alive, who had been keeping this hope alive for years, way before even we were born or we uh, started our work. And it was a wonderful way for us to educate our this generation and the next generation on this amazing work that was taking place and why it's so important that they continue to keep that hope alive with their own actions in their own communities. And I wanted to kind of end with uh, one of the very major uh, peace-related campaigns that Green Hope Foundation uh, started targeted at young people. It's uh, our We Want Books, Not Nukes campaign. And so through all of the work that we do towards peace, you know, it's really towards ensuring uh, conflict resolution in communities affected by all of these different uh, disasters and problems. But one of the main existential threats that does exist is the threat of nuclear weapons. And we often get this kind of, uh, like people tell us that, you know, what can civil society, what can young people do to address this issue? Because while we can take ground level actions to address you know, climate change, um, work towards poverty alleviation, nuclear weapons are a completely different story. And so what we realized was we needed education, especially for young people and children to enable them to learn more about what the threat that existed and kind of remove this veil of secrecy that exists around nuclear weapons. And so our We Want Books Not Nukes campaign was launched and it has been super successful because we are now educating our current and the next generation about what what the threat is and how they can utilize their voice to create change, even as children, when they grow up to become policymakers, and as people committed to uh, bringing about change, and how it is intrinsically linked with climate change and the environmental causes, as well as uh, the social causes. So that was uh, that is how we at Green Hope Foundation utilize technology for social good, and we truly believe that it's important to keep this hope alive, and we can definitely keep this hope alive by focusing on uh, the positive the actions, the successes that people around the world have undertaken and learning from the failures and kind of moving ahead so that we are actually able to achieve a more peaceful world with the lesson that it takes 
every single person contributing to create a more sustainable and peaceful world. And we must definitely use the tools at our disposal to create this more peaceful world. So that is where technology comes in. So thank you very much and uh, happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so now I will just run through yeah, lots of applause there. Um, what we'll do now is if anybody would like to ask any questions uh, for the next 10 or so minutes, um, uh, we will run through some questions um, and then we can extend if you'd like to stay or we can continue without you. Um, so uh, you can either raise your virtual hand or uh, physical hand if you'd like to ask a question or you could put it in the chat, uh, which Drea is monitoring and she'll make that um, make us aware of that. So um, would anybody like to kick us off with a comment or a question perhaps? Um, so kick us in. David Gallup. Yeah, uh, so I'm just so impressed with the, the Green Hope Foundation. I find it amazing. And especially because one of the things I've been saying, because I've been sort of in this, in the world peace and justice field for like 33, 34 years already, um, is that the intersectionalities that your uh, foundation is working on. I think that's amazing to bring peace, justice, environment, um, uh, anti-war, anti-nuke, and technology all together. I just, I, I don't really have a question. I just have that comment that I find that that's incredible because I, I really think that that those different uh, sectors of, of uh, change in society are all in separate silos, but you found a way through Green Hope uh, to keep hope alive and uh, to to bring those different sectors together. I just, that's amazing. Thank you for, for all the work you're doing. Thank you very much. And yeah, that's, it's very evident once you kind of work within this movement that, yeah, you can't address issues in silos and that those, the actions that you do take all contribute to uh, a more peaceful world. So, but thank you for your comment. Thank you, David. Um, we can maybe now go to Donna. Yeah, um, like, you had your answer. yeah like David, I, I don't really have a question. I just stand in awe of what you're doing and want to thank you and just say that, you know, perhaps um, uh, uh, we can find ways to support your work, either uh, with Citizens for Global Solutions or the World Federalist Movement, the international group. Um, I just uh, just uh, want to say thank you and let's figure out a way to work together. Absolutely. Thank Absolutely. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Alan, would you like to go next? I think you have a question. I think Rebecca's before me. Oh, Rebecca, would you like to go? No. OK, Alan, you're next. Hi. OK, well, well thanks, James. Um, and first, just a thanks to CGS. Um, for picking up this book um, of Douglas Roach, um, which the theme, you know, hope is really, really important. And of course, you've got a wonderful speaker today. Hello, Kekishan. Really lovely to see you again. Um, so Kekishan and I work together quite closely in the World Future Council, um, and we've done a, a number of projects together. Uh, but I just want to start with sort of the inspiration of Douglas Roach, because to me, he really did embody this idea of finding solutions and finding hope. Uh, and even when the going is tough, you know, Doug would always come out with sort of like some positive ways of dealing with these issues and taking things forward. And we see the same thing with Kekashan. Um, and one of the things I'm really impressed, Kekashan, with the work that you're doing is you managed to make an incredible connection between being active and effective at the global level on policy and governance issues and being really effective and active at the grassroots level and then making a bridge between them so that those who are working at the grassroots level actually understand that what's happening at the United Nations actually does make a difference and it actually impacts on their lives. Because for many people, the UN seems a bit like an ivory tower. You know, that if they're not directly engaged in the policy, it's like, how does it affect our lives? And what you've been doing in your projects is you'll be making that connection. Here are some projects that are happening and it's connected with some UN developments. So I'm really interested, you know, if you say a little bit more about when you're talking about this at the grassroots level, how, how do those conversations go? Like, are people very ignorant at the beginning of the UN? 
Do they have misconceptions about the UN? Um, do they do their eyes light up? You know, when they like hear some of like your experiences of what it actually means to be involved in the policy and, and how that relates to what's happening at the grassroots. So that's my first question. And second question is, given the connection between you know progress, you know, at the global level, um, and support at the grassroots. What do you think would be your choice? I know there's a number of different proposals. Your choice of the most important theme or proposal to the UN Summit of the Future that might really help, you know, what are things happening at the grassroots level? Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Alan. As always, wonderful to see you. And I, I like, I think Alan, I first met Alan when I was 11 or 12. So um, Alan has seen my entire uh, journey through Green Hope Foundation. Um, yeah, you know, thank you for both of those uh, questions. The, for the first one, uh, it really depends on where we are. So, you know, if you're working with um, in a school environment or like an academic environment uh, in a community, in like a general urban community, uh, there is knowledge of what the UN does, but it's kind of very separate from what goes on at the grassroots and they think that, you know, the young people specifically, they think that they have nothing to do with it unless you, you're thinking about going into uh, politics or studying uh, political science. So there is a misconception that, uh, you know, it really doesn't relate at all to what goes on at the ground level. And then we work to kind of change that because we, uh, through the work that we do and through the advocacy that we do at the UN as well, it's uh, it's we just you know try to make them realize that uh, the actions that are being taken to address all of these different issues, they are connected to, for instance, the sustainable development goals, and it requires every single person to localize the SDGs and achieve these goals, it can't be done by an institution alone. So that is in one area of civil society. When we go into the super rural conservative communities, there is no knowledge of the UN. I mean, they are concerned about where their next meal will come from. There is tremendous inequity that exists. And so, you know, that their main concern is survival. Uh, so that, you know, UN doesn't factor into that at all. But what we do there is that uh, the work that we do, we try to ensure that they understand that it contributes to not only their well-being, but also the well-being of their community and to the wider world in general. And this idea resonates very well with the children that we work with specifically because they absolutely love the idea that uh, fellow children around the world would also benefit from them doing something all. So, uh, you know, when we went into one example I can share is like when we were working in the Rohingya refugee camps on the Bangladesh uh, Myanmar border, uh, we were utilizing art as a way to engage with them, you know, how their ideas in a better world for all, because they didn't know how to read and write. So art was the way to go. And every single child, their message was that, you know, I want to create this world not only for me, but for my friends across the world. And the idea of uh, this of peace across the world was something that resonated with them. And, you know, that's kind of the idea of what we try to do at the highest levels of policymaking, creating peace for everyone and creating a better world for all. But at the grassroots level, the UN doesn't factor in. But the idea of what we the UN is trying to do and what all of us are trying to do, the the message is very much present at the ground level. So I hope that answers your first question. And for the second one, uh, you know, it's, again, all of these issues are interconnected. So it's hard to just focus on one, but what I would say is that there should be some kind of uh, focus on bridging this gap between the top down and bottom up processes and supporting organizations that do to work on the ground. Uh, I think one of the biggest challenges that exists for you know, grassroots organizations like us is uh, funding and monetary, the lack of funding and monetary support because we are utilizing the meager resources that we have to create change. Whereas you have all of this money that does exist, you know, money that goes into uh, building nuclear weapons and weapons of mass destruction and uh, money that, you know, billionaires have, the private sector has, governments have that aren't being utilized uh, for to their fullest potential. So I think some kind of focus on how to kind of turn, uh, utilize that money uh, and put it towards 
where the work is actually happening. And that is, I think, one of the best ways that we can bridge the gap between top down and bottom up processes. So I would say that that is what I would want to advocate for uh, the summit of the future discussing, because you're having you're discussing all of these issues. But if you don't take into account what the grassroots what the work on the ground and the reality on the grassroots is and how you can support that through this very important funding, then, you know, it, it will again just be just a summit than nothing else you, to turn that talk into action you need money and i want some kind of discussion to be uh there around that so i hope that answers both of your questions wonderful thank you kikshan um so next up we've got rebecca and then beirat and then erica with questions is that okay we can keep going a bit longer yep great so rebecca take it away please uh, thanks. So one question um, and uh, one polite uh, suggestion. Uh, so the question first, Kekishan, keeping on this theme of the summit of the future, one of the outcomes of the summit is um, a, a draft for future generations. And often we see the needs, um, rights, um, and hopes, to use the word of the day, of future generations coupled with those of youth and with children. And so I'm interested for you and your work, what you see as the particular rights of future generations and how can we um, uh, as custodians, um, uh, I guess, represent uh, those rights um, in, in, in fact. Um, and now the suggestion is that while um, it's really self-evident why Honorable Roche called you a voice for future generations or the voice of the future, I think, um, he had one quibble with you, I think when you were extolling the virtues of Zoom, which is that he missed um, hugging, uh, getting strength from hugs from friends in the peace community. And so before Kekishan leaves us for the session, if you don't choose to stay for the entire book club discussion, I would politely suggest that maybe we try to have a little virtual hug and capture that memory um, with a screenshot. So I'm just gonna cue everybody up for that. That will be the last thing hopefully before Kekishan leaves us. Um, and sorry for all the non-huggers in the room. Zoe, oh. thank you for that question and the suggestion. Yes, absolutely. I think that uh, yeah, th to address your the second uh, part for us, yes, uh, you know, that would be really wonderful. And that is, you know, there's pros and cons to like every single solution uh, out there. Like Zoom was one of the best ways that we could connect during the pandemic, but it, it really was a very different way of connecting with uh, people. And for those who did value in-person work more and that very human connection, yeah, no, it was it was really, really hard, even for us, like those who work on the ground, um, you know, we had to find really, really creative ways to kind of go out there and actually connect with those because the digital world was just one way that we could work through the pandemic. The ground, there, there's a lot of different realities. So absolutely, like that is something I definitely did recognize as well from my end. And in terms of uh, rights of future generations, uh, I think that uh, like just a few things. One, uh, you know, understanding how important it is to not just view us as future generations, but the current generation as well and people who are creating change and supporting that. I think that is really critical because, yeah, we are often seen as future generations because we're like myself and those who are now way younger are growing up and aren't seen as uh, the current generation yet but as someone who started her work very very young and and i work with people who are really really young as well uh labeling their work and them is just okay yeah the future generations will do it afterwards like that is that that's really difficult to see because then it's like okay but what about the work that they are doing so that's why i use the term current and future generations because that really takes it that the work and the really important actions that they're taking uh, into account as well. So I feel like that is uh, definitely something that every single person can think about regardless of their age. Even young people sometimes refer to themselves as we're the future generations, but we are the current generation as well. So uh, just taking that into account. And the second one would be understanding, again, 
everyone can do this uh, is that young people, we are not a homogenous entity, just like any other social and any other stakeholder group. We have very different challenges in different parts of the world. I think the common factor just being that we are all below a certain age. Uh, and so taking that into account when uh, putting forward anything regarding rights of future generations, and that's where intersectionality, I guess, would come in as well. And so uh, I remember the outcome document of Rio Plus 20 being uh, called the future, future We Want. There were calls for an ombudsperson uh, for future generations and, uh, you know, young people were like were taken into account there. But then that was not really uh, showcased in the actual conference with only five people under the age of 18. And so that is kind of where things need to change. So like, I'm hoping that this one, the summit of the future actually does not just relegate young people to oh, the youth, their future generations, but people who are actually creating change. So I hope that answers your question. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so now if we can go maybe to Berat and then to Erica. Oh, well, hello. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, that was wonderful. Uh, you know, we're a part of this uh, book club. The subject is to keep hope alive. And your example of work and commitment and passion uh, makes me optimistic because so much of the world, events that go on make you very pessimistic about the future. And I'm really happy to see you like shine like diamond. Uh, the question now is, I seeing those projects that you showed uh, in Liberia, India, Bangladesh, uh, is there a kind of a follow-up? So those are not just single examples in terms of, is there a replication? Is there some kind of a zeal, a movement taking place where these things multiply on their own. You almost like kind of need a, a gene, uh, you know, uh, sort of pushed into the community uh, so that young and old come together and replicate uh, these wonderful uh, means. Uh, and perhaps with Zoom and other things, you could have ongoing meetings which involves more and more grassroots people around the world. So then, you know, songs like We Are the World begin to have a meaning. Uh, I was uh, kind of like, your life a little bit reminds me of the optimism I had when I was about your age or a bit older. Uh, I was very active in the first Earth Summit in 1972. And we were so optimistic and we formed a lot of global groups. But about a decade later, everything just sort of disappeared. Uh, we all kind of went into our cocoons and uh, we lost that. Uh, but we didn't have the uh, benefit of Zoom and internet at that time. And now that you have it, maybe it'll be different. And I wish you well. And uh, uh, thank you very much for giving me this uh, sense of hope. <laughs> uh, you. And, you know, if you have some comments about some of these things, I'd appreciate it. Uh, one additional thing that come to mind, you raised the issue of finance. Well, we tried to do that here in our state of Minnesota, uh, when, again, I was very active with the Millennium Development Goals. And there the issue was to finance it, uh, we needed to have Minnesota commit to the 0.7% of the uh, you know, GDP of our state. So we had people give up. Uh, having coffee for one day a week. And that way we were able to collect uh, quite a bit of money. So I have a feeling that even finances can be raised through grassroots 
with, uh, you know, with the commitment and dedication. So, uh, you know, it's just an example of, of, of things lived in the past, but I'm happy you're living in the present and for the future. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments and for your questions. Yes, absolutely. Grassroots funding from the grassroots, like that is something that, you know, we already kind of rely on. It's that when we, there is a lot more that needs to be done and the funding from the grassroots, it's just not enough to create the change that needs to happen because obviously there's different sectors that do exist. Um, so that is where like, you know, kind of we, try to raise awareness about what can be done with uh that money there and how it can be utilized for good so like right now i'm finishing up my mba here um at cornell one of the courses that was instituted just in my year was philanthropy for people who are going into like investment banking and people who are becoming entrepreneurs and going to be really really rich like what do you do with all of this money that comes to you and how can you use it for social good and you would be like shocked to hear like as young people like they're older than me but still they're young and uh the, the way some of them think about you know how uh to kind of monopolize all of this money and not give it for social good and so those philanthropy lessons are really really important uh to kind of spread uh the word of what everyone can do with that money so i just wanted to comment uh on that and for uh the taking forward and the long-term aspect of the work we do. Yes, absolutely. The examples that I shared are, you know, kind of uh, what we instituted after years of work in the communities and uh, then the work continues. We've gotten questions from people about, you know, you got, got work sometimes work in the same places or you're kind of implementing, uh, you know, you're posting about the same solutions and it's like, we are trying to create long-term change. So obviously we're going to work in these, continue to work in these communities. We never want it to be a one-off um, project and just leave it at that. We want to create long-term change. And as I mentioned in my presentation, that requires patience, effort, and a lot of hard work. And that is exactly what we do. And then we spread the word through all of uh, the different, you know, means that are there outside one of which is through music art dance sport creative ways of communication and actually in the chat i'll just uh share uh that one of the things that we use is music and we've composed our own uh songs on peace for instance uh to kind of uh, utilize that mode of communication to reach out to others and spread the word about what goes on at uh, the ground level. So there's all of these different instances that do exist. And for us, absolutely, the goal is long-term change. And that's exactly what we've been doing for the last 11 and a half years. So every single one of our projects uh, is, is super, super long-term. So thank you very much for asking that though, because that is a really important uh, thing to be addressed. Okay, Kishan, thank you very much. Um, we have one more question, I think on the roster, which is Erica. Uh, would you like to take that away? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first, thank you so much for your presentation. This has been a really uh, wonderful experience to connect some of what um, Douglas Roach was speaking about in the first uh, session of the book club. Uh, you mentioned some really important things around education and uh, community and some of it being fostered through Zoom and, and much of the work you do within communities. Um, uh, I myself am from a rural area where, you know, commuting to get to something perhaps to organize was just not something available to me in my youth. And so I was wondering if you have, you know, advice looking for young people who want to organize and discuss issues, whether it be related to sustainability or even more related to world federalism and um, the summit of the future, especially since, like you said, uh, unless they envision themselves going into politics, they don't see their involvement as being that critical or, or maybe like it's a place for them any advice that someone maybe something someone said to you that got you involved so young yeah absolutely thank you for that question and you know um what one thing that because again like different situations different parts of the world uh, i i think I, one aspect that i always say is that 
seeing what your like local challenge challenges and solutions that have already been implemented are and then kind of going from there i think that again because of the disconnect between what goes on at the un and the highest levels of policy making and what goes on at the ground level young people often feel that you know the work that's been going on there or what they're doing is like you know it's not contributing to that but taking the time to kind of understand how even the smallest actions that uh, they take, uh, whether that even through that one simple community action uh, contributes to this, you know, wider achievement of all of the UN goals. Uh, I think that is a really wonderful way to, that's a starting point that I guess would be a general starting point for every uh, young person out there and then kind of utilizing the tools that they already have at their disposal. So I think right now, technology is something that a lot of young people do have access to and kind of going from there and utilizing social media to spread awareness, to gain more knowledge, to connect with other young people, and then turning those the, those talks into grand level actions and kind of continuing both the discussions and uh, the actions. And for the communities, the young people that we work with in the communities where they aren't connected at all to what goes on at the UN or even to the digital world, then, you know, kind of as young people ourselves, we take the onus upon ourselves to make sure that these young people have the skill sets to work within their communities and their voices get heard at the highest levels, um, including at the UN. So it's this really uh, multifaceted process uh, that requires all of us, but utilizing the tools at our disposal that are already there and not trying to reinvent the wheel is, I think, one of the best ways that as young people we can engage. So I hope that answers your question. Terrific. So do we have any more questions from the group or comments? So I just want to bring two things to everybody's attention that was dropped in the comments in case you didn't see it. Um, one is by Alan, um, which is about the um, UN Special Envoy for Future Generations, which is um, one of the many initiatives promoted um, by the Mobilizing an Earth Governance Alliance. And the other is um, the uh, trustee, Earth Trusteeship Initiative, which has overlapping resonance. Um, those those links are in the um, in the chat uh, posted by Alan and Rebecca. Super interesting. If you're interested to follow up with that, um, Alan, you've got your hand up. Yeah, should I just mention very briefly why I put in on the um, commissioners uh, guardians of future generations is because it's another the proposal that all future councils put forward is another example of working at the multiple levels of governance. So there's been a lot of attention to the idea of a UN special envoy for future generations, and we think that's going to be established. But what's just as important, or probably more important, is to establish similar guardians, commissioners, protectors, ombudspersons of future generations at regional levels, national levels, and even at local levels, at city levels, because that's where it can really be implemented and make a real impact. Um, and that doesn't require the agreement of all the states' parties at the summer of the future for people to establish. Already some have. You know, there's a, there's a Wales uh, commissioner for future generations is working really, really well on looking at all the, you know, policies for Wales, you know, which is a, um, a is that a country or <laughs> part of uh, the United Kingdom? Um, anyway, for the policies for Wales, they actually have to sort of go through the the um, Future Generations Commission to see that the policies are actually consistent with sustainability for the future. So it can happen at all levels. And that's why I sort of put it in there, because I think it follows the sort of like the talk that we've had about working at both the grassroots level and also at the global levels. Thanks. Rebecca, would you like to continue? Uh, yes, yeah, so I just wanted to pick up that uh, that train of thought that this is an example of um, progressive federalism, world federalism in action. Um, yes, Wales is a country within the state of the United Kingdom, uh, and yes, it has a devolved uh, National Assembly. Um, but this is something that we can do, as, as Alan pointed out, in our own communities as well. And at all levels, through complementarity and cooperation, um, we can see um, how the different uh, hyper-local to imminently global work together. Um, 
And with that, is that a fitting note on which to perhaps um, thank Kekushan enormously for her contributions to today's discussion and perhaps invite that opportunity for a screenshot of a group hug for Honorable Roche in particular? So Jair, are you able to facilitate the, the screenshot? All right, cool. All right. So you, you call us off, Dre. You, 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 okay. You... Are we ready for our hug? Oh, this is perfect. Okay, I'm gonna do the screenshot. Hold on just a moment. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. So James, would you like to pick up as moderator on the next? Yes. So um, what we would typically do now is we would, uh, uh, Kekushan has just dropped off the of the call. If there are any other, any more discussion we'd like to have about the um, presentation or about the book uh, related to the presentation, uh, about Kekushan's role in the book, um, we've, we've had quite an active discussion so far, so I don't know if there are any more comments out there or thoughts that you'd like to bring. David. Well, I just think Kekushan would be a wonderful speaker to, to engage the students in our World Citizen Club, whether it's at George Mason or our future club. She'd be amazing, especially because she is a lot younger than, than most of us, right? Um, and uh, would be able to, uh, I think, really excite them about the work that, that she's done and, and maybe find a way locally here in the DC area to also engage Green Hope Foundation. Noted. Um, is there any anybody else have any thoughts? Not right now. Okay, so typically what we do at the end of book club is open it up to discussion of any other business. Um, so uh, offering the opportunity to promote any initiatives that you're involved in or anything you've got coming up in your calendar that you want to share with the rest of us. David, you've got your hand up again. Yeah, sorry. So um, there's going to be a, a World Court of Human Rights Coalition meeting on uh, April Wednesday, April 24th at 11 a.m. I'll, I'll call up the Zoom link. There's going to be an amazing um, speaker who's from South Africa. Um, and uh, so there's the link for it. But I'll, uh, she is an LGBTQ plus rights advocate. Um, so I'll also... Uh, Put a little bit about her here in the in the link so you know we always welcome uh anyone who wants to come to that coalition meeting to ask questions to learn uh and to see how we can build that coalition uh i'd love to see you there and i'll i'll, I'll put in the date again here so everyone knows uh when it is thanks thank you david erica I just wanted to highlight that um, the summer edition for Mondial, the submissions are, our portal is open. So um, for those who likely seen newsletters, but we are accepting submissions on the Canadian and US side. So um, check that out. David, I see you have your hand raised. Would you like to jump in? Yes, I'd um, like everyone to mark their calendar to attend the Zoom meeting for the St. Louis chapter of Citizens for Global Solutions on Sunday afternoon, May 19th at 2 p.m. Central Time. And our guest speaker will be Rebecca Schutt, who will uh, speak about uh, different aspects of uh, World Federation. Is that everything, David? Pardon? Was that everything? Yeah. Uh, well, um, I don't know if you want any more discussion about uh, the book or not. Certainly. Yes. Okay. Um, I, I'm sorry that I wasn't able to attend last month when uh, Ambassador Roche was on the program. Um, from reading his book, I would have asked him, maybe some of you know, whether he was familiar with uh, Joseph Schwartzberg's work on reforming the United Nations. 
because it seems to me from what I've read that uh, uh, Senator Roach was very much involved in the way the United Nations system is as it is, but uh, didn't give much reflection on reforming it and how to change it. And especially with his concern about nuclear weapons, I can't imagine that changing without a change from a um, present United Nations to a World Federation and how we might be able to solve that problem under the current international system. And also um, the difference between um, international law, which he talks about, is simply a, a treaty agreements between countries in, instead of trying to create world laws that would actually uh, be enforceable. So those are the kinds of uh, questions that I would have um, addressed to Senator Roche. Does anyone know whether he was familiar with Joseph Schwartzberg's uh, work? Would anybody like to respond? He didn't mention it in the previous session. Um, we we but... can send him that question specifically on, on Joseph Schwartzberg. Um, and I assume that Alan and, and others perhaps can, can reflect on, on current um, attempts to, to reform the UN system, including through the Summit of the Future process, um, as Alan has his hand up. And if anyone could send me uh, Senator Roach's email, then I could send them a number of uh, maybe summaries of Schwartzberg's work. Alan, would you like to take us on? You, you were sorry, in... just getting back. Sorry, just getting back to screen. Um, just two quick things on uh, the two quite big campaigns that CGS is doing in cooperation with WFM, uh, and that's the uh, Mega Mobilizing an Earth Governments Alliance. So, just in case you didn't uh, catch it, we did the launch uh, of Mega on March twenty sixth, uh, hybrid event. Um, and now we've started with the first editions of the newsletter. So if you want to keep up to date on what's happening with the Mobilising Earth Governments Alliance, um, and it's got you know proposals for um, Earth Governments, uh, then you can sign up to the newsletter and visit the website. And I can put the newsletter link uh, there in the chat uh, in case you don't already receive it. Um, and then the other big project that we're doing cooperatively, WFM and CGS, is Legal Alternatives to War, Law Not War. Um, but you probably already know that there's a crowdfunding campaign uh, running at the moment. Um, we've been doing a number of events on the Law Not War. We just had a big roundtable uh, at the Interparliamentary Union where we had parliamentarians from around the world uh, part participating uh, in our discussion on uh, the International Court of Justice and Value. Um, and we'll just put out um, a flyer, which is part of the idea of successes of the International Court of Justice. Um, and we're rolling some of those out on the crowdfunding campaign as well, so that people get to know that there have been really good success stories with the International Court of Justice um, and decisions which are in the most are accepted and implemented by the parties to a dispute. So I'll put that link in the chat soon too. Thank you. Oh, and on Tuesday, there is a meeting of the participating organizations of Law Not War, and CGS is one of the forces co-hosting organizations. Doing and how to advance a crowd running campaign. Uh, I'll, I'll put the registration link in the chat as well. Thank you, Alan. Um, Rebecca, do you like to follow up? Uh, yes, um, maybe Alan, could you share a little bit more about, um, since I already plugged it at the outset, um, the uh, civil society conference, the UN civil society conference, the role of impact coalitions, um, how MEGA and uh, Law Not War are featured there, and also if you have any reflections on what we have um, articulated within the pact for the the people's pact for the future and the peace and security chapter, the themes that I think really follow from this book. Um, I'll I'll glom on to to fill in the blanks, but I, I'd like you as our, our guest to have the opportunity to go first. 
Um, and I would also note that um, the World Court of Human Rights, David, um, is very much um, included uh, within our current draft uh, recommendations for the People's Pact for the Future. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. I'll be brief. So the um, UN Civil Society Conference, it's an annual UN Civil Society Conference, uh, is in, Na in Nairobi. This year, the theme is on the summit of the future. Uh, there have been uh, um, an opening for submissions for workshops and impact coalitions. Uh, and on the impact coalition side, we put in uh, on both Mobilize an Earth Governance Alliance, and also on legal alternatives to war. Both of them got accepted in form. They're not exactly the same as what we put them in because the idea of an impact coalition is to actually build cooperation with others that are working on it. So it's slightly broader. The, the one is on Earth Governance and the other one is on uh, just institutions, international justice institutions and the International Court of Justice. So we will be going into Nairobi, being able to build a lot more um, uh, outreach and engagement of other organizations that are working in the field and, uh, and help to build more cooperation on both of those projects, MEGA and the Law Not War project, through bringing them into these impact coalition forums at the uh, Civil Society Conference in Nairobi. Was that the question you asked me, Rebecca? Oh, sorry, and the second one is there's also, um, of course, the governments are drafting a pact for the future, which will be adopted uh, at the Summit of the Future in September, and a declaration for future generations that will be adopted by the UN General Assembly in association with the summit. Uh, what civil society, a, a large number, are working together on uh, to feed into that process is something called the People's Pact for the Future. An interim pact was prepared for the Global Futures Forum in March last year. And now there have been teams working on various chapters of that to feed into an updated People's Pact for the Future, uh, which we released at the uh, Civil Society Forum in Nairobi. Rebecca and I have been working on chapter two of that, which is on the peace and security. So it picks up on a lot of what had been done previously, but it builds in a lot of the feedback and comments that have been made on improving you know, ideas of, uh, of uh, improving multilateral mechanisms and approaches for peace and international security. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you, you, Alan. Um, so we've got Alex uh, with his hand up. I know he wants, um, but I know Alec, but I know what Alex wants to say. Um, so that could be something to conclude us. Does anybody else have any um, further comments about the book or thoughts um, before we wrap up the conversation? No hands raised. Okay, I'll go to Alex. And if anybody comes up with any thoughts in the meantime, please raise your hand. Alex, shoot. Thank you. Um... So just following up on uh, one of Douglas Roach's requests, uh, for anyone who purchased the book on Amazon, uh, it would be very nice to leave a review on Amazon that helps uh, with the visibility of the book and in turn, of course, spread the message for peace that he has. And uh, I'm just going to share my screen really quickly for those um, who might not be able to. Of course, you have to... Um... Okay, I can now. So yes, uh, you have to have purchased the book on Amazon in order to be able to do it. Um, but uh, if you just go to Amazon uh, and you type in um, Douglas Roche, uh, you should be able to find the book. Uh, you can also find it probably in your returns and orders if you've already purchased it. So if you go on uh, over here, this is uh, not signed in, but uh, here's my signed in version. So it will say that you've purchased the item uh, allowing you to leave a review. Uh, you can scroll down or you can go to the ratings directly, but uh, there should be a place uh, under customer reviews where you can uh, write a customer review and um, just fill it out. You can add a photo. Um, so the better the review, uh, the better the book gets out there to the uh, world population. Thank you, Alex. Very practical, useful. Uh, information. Um, I think we're a little bit early, um, so we've got some time. Uh, we're usually on till um, about one thirty. Um, so if anybody has any other business, uh, this is the time. Rebecca, you had your hand raised earlier at the time of any other business. Is there anything to go back to you? 
Uh, four? Uh, please go to Virginia first, and then um, I think uh, we can oh, Virginia, talk sorry. about I didn't... future book clubs and um, ask for suggestions, yes. Sorry, Virginia, I didn't see your hand there raised. Uh, please. <laughs> That's Continue. no problem. I, I was cons one of the, I thought one of Douglas Roach's most wonderful achievements was the Middle Powers Initiative. And I was really wondering why that wasn't brought up as part of his conversation. And um, it, 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 it's a model for the future, what he did uh, with the Middle Powers Initiative. And I'm, I have a lot of concerns uh, that that isn't brought forward into the future. Thank you, Virginia. Um, would anybody like to respond? Or is that our closing thought um, for the book? Alan. Yeah, I can quickly respond because I remember being with uh, Doug when he came up with the idea for the Middle Powers Initiative and we consulted and said, yeah, let's sort of do it. And uh, Doug became the chair of it and did incredible work when he was the chair of the initiative. What we've seen is that there is now a number of what we call like like-minded groupings around particular initiatives and projects. So it's not like just one group of middle power countries with sort of like, you know, many tasks. It's actually like there's a like-minded group working on, um, for example, on the, the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice, you know, where a group of countries did a, a declaration and we're working with them on law, not war a different like-minded group of countries, sometimes intersection working on a, on another proposal. So the idea of this of middle power countries working together to have influence is still very much alive. And, and the, the example of the Middle Powers Initiative when it was led by Doug Roach has inspired much of that activity. Um, and of course, the Middle Powers Initiative was cooperation between uh, effective civil society organizations you know and governments and it's that partnership i think is now it's it's a good model and it's working and we're seeing it working in other fields so it hasn't gone away it's just it's in different versions now thank you alan rebecca uh yeah just to add to to what alan um uh contributed it's 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 a little bit more difficult to to follow the ball because it's not one issue and it's one, not one or um, even one kind of grouping of, of states at this point. There are still the normal geographic groupings. There are groupings like SID, small um, uh, island developing states. There are still BRICS um, movements, but then there are things like. Um, how many uh, like-minded states is it that uh, led the Declaration 36 uh, for compulsory jurisdiction of the ICJ, Alan? Yeah. Um, and they're kind of all over the place um, for very different reasons. So as civil society trying to work in cooperation with member states, there isn't necessarily one door to knock on. Um, and... Uh, you know, we as a CGS and WFM, of course, were instrumental in the founding of the coalition for the ICC, and we're still bringing that energy and that momentum to the initiatives uh, that we're currently working on with member states, which include the ICC to this day, of course. Um, but it is it is a little bit more complicated dance. And when you have something like the Summit of the Future, where um, at this point, civil society has been largely excluded from the consultations between states, uh, between and among states um, that are happening in New York um, at the UN. Uh, those of us even with ECOSOC status are, are um, excluded from the gallery where we would normally be able to at least observe, if not actively participate. We've had to find our own ways in. Um, and here I, you know, I think I commend as instructional um, the entrepreneurial spirit of the Coalition for the UN we need, of which um, uh, uh, yeah, I think all uh, uh, WFM Canada, WFM and um, CGS uh, play an active role. Um, in trying to host side meetings and um, woo sometimes, court sometimes, um, member states 
uh, in uh, solo or in, in groupings. And sometimes those groupings don't make uh, they, they're not what you think at the outset. They're, they don't um, make the most sense on the page. Uh, and they spring to life organically by a series of jointed interests. And that I think brings us back to the principles of world federalism actually. Um, and um, so these are the kind of discussions that we are we are trying to have, some of them openly, some of them um, on a uh, more close to the best kind of basis um, to, to shape the future that we know we need. Fantastic. Okay, so I think uh, to close us off, um, thumbs up from Virginia, um, a little bit of information about the next session, which is going to be a little bit different. Um, we're going to be featuring articles from Mondial, from the winter edition, which has been very warmly received. Um, lots of interesting topics there. And the idea is that we'll be bringing together various authors uh, who contributed to Mondial to participate in that discussion. So it'll be a bit more focused in terms of uh, those articles are obviously a lot shorter than the books we usually cover, um, but more general in that we will have uh, more authors to discuss them. Um, that'll be on the 25th of May. Uh, Drea has helpfully put the link in the uh, chat. That will take you to our website. And if you scroll down uh, just below um, the large uh, image of, of Doug Roach's book, then you'll see that the session three, May 25th, 2024, um, with the information there and the link to register. Um, and I think, does anybody need any assistance with that? We're oh, all good. Um, I think that's us for today. Um, Thank you for joining us. It's been another great session, really inspirational, great chat as well. Lots of useful information off the back of uh, Keiko Shan's presentation, really inspirational to see somebody that young, that together, almost frightening. Um, and uh, really looking forward to the next session, which should be another good discussion. So thanks everybody for today. Um, oh, Rebecca, raised hand. Uh, yes, just Dre James, Drea, and Alan, if I could catch you after we stop recording for five minutes of unrelated business to just go through some things on our to-do list. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Uh, don't forget, David's got his uh, um, chapter event on the 19th of May. Put that in your diaries. Um, lots coming up. See you all soon.